This is Oliver here, and you're watching Teacher Learning Cast with Pidi Herrera and Benjamin Stewart. Okay, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number two. My name is Benjamin Stewart. And at the other end, this is Piri Herrera from Aguas Calientes, Mexico, starring our second show, Benjamin, which I'm very glad we managed to, to accomplish this uh, adventure since last week. Absolutely. Uh, it's, been a, it's a beautiful day here in uh, beautiful Aguas Calientes. And uh, yeah, we're anxious to get started with this. We've been talking about it for some time now. We started last week. And uh, we're happy uh, to, to know that we have a few followers already in and, and Facebook. If you want to get involved in the broadcast, we want to make this a podcast community as much as possible where you can be an active participant. So uh, we are always looking for people to participate in the live event with us and also those who want to participate uh, via just the uh, different forums that we have. We have a Facebook page at Teacher Learning Cast. Uh, feel free to join the page and post your comments and suggestions uh, to based on what we're talking about each week. And uh, yeah, I'm also transmitting in Facebook Live for some people. And uh, if you want to have a better view, well, you just click on the link above and you will go to the streaming, uh, which... Um, Right now, um, we just have the view of the background. We still don't have the streaming there, I guess. Maybe there's a lag delay or something, but we are about to uh, have the live streaming going on there. And today, uh, last week, we were discussing a couple of things about Creative Commons. We were discussing uh, about um, technology that, uh, that speeds up communication with the students. And for this week, we have a couple of issues we want to discuss with you. And um, Benjamin, what do you have for this week? Well, I'll go ahead and share my screen today. I wanted to talk about, uh, I came across an article called Making Teaching Personal. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get, uh, get my uh, screen here going so that you can actually see the article. Right. Uh, uh, let me tell you that since the moment I saw... Um, the title you chose for for the topic today, it, it it was catchy. It made me think a lot of things. So I'm really uh, intrigued to know what is that about making teaching personal. It sounds like a fight or something. Exactly. Well, if you look at uh, this was an article. I don't know now if you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. But uh, Rachel Apley posted a really nice piece uh, this week uh, in in Oxford University Press where she was talking about sharing a story she had with uh, some of her students. Uh, she unfortunately had her briefcase stolen, and I think her passport uh, was stolen as well. And she actually found out a way later on to really incorporate that, that experience in with her, with her student. And I, I want to read one paragraph in particular because I think it's, it shows a lot of insight and some of her conclusions that she drew for – from having this experience and really sharing this unfortunate set of circumstances with her students. Uh, she states, of course, it was only with hindsight that it dawned on me what a golden opportunity this was and how much I could exploit it. After all, this was my upper intermediate insurance class. Without hesitation, they started firing questions at me about the, the contents of my bags, uh, the value of the items in question, exactly what had happened, whether I was insured, and so on. They then insisted on helping me fill in the claim form so as to get the best deal possible. I couldn't have broken this news to a more sympathetic or expert group. They gave me insights into the industry that I'd never known otherwise. In return, we worked on form filling, question forms, formal insurance language versus everyday spoken English, the passive, and much more besides. My longer term course plan was ditched for the next few weeks, but during these weeks, attendance rose 
and engagement and involvement was higher than it had ever been. You know, and when I read this, especially this, this particular paragraph, it really, you know, a lot of things jumped out at me, um, you know, because sometimes I think that we get so caught up in our own lesson planning and, and what we're doing in class that we kind of feel like we are almost uh, restricted to just doing what's in the lesson plan, even if it's our own, uh, even if it's of our own doing. But I, I think this is a really good example where she found a teachable moment that this particular uh, set of circumstances, she was actually, to, she was able to bring this experience to the class and they actually uh, became the experts and started to give her advice, which she could do, actually started helping her, uh, feel, like she mentioned, fill out the forms and so on. So I don't know, I found this really interesting and I, it made me reflect on my own teaching and really how much, first of all, what it means to make teaching personal. And then in my own part particular case, how often I do that, do I do that? Do I do it to, uh, to get the most out of the, the teaching experience, the learning experience in my own class? I don't know, Petey, what, do uh, what, do what did you think about when you read this article? Well, it, it, it's really interesting, and and with the comments you're just making, it raises uh, a lot of uh, memories to my mind about what the students talk about. My, I work with, uh, and we work with with teachers' information, and one of the issues that very often come is following the lesson plan or not. When they are information, they are really afraid of going out of the lesson plan. And when they start to get out of the lesson plan, they don't know how far they can go. So it's a really interesting question. And I think it's a good example what, what uh, this story on that issue, right? Uh, how it uh, may raise a little bit more of uh, curiosity by students. But you also mentioned something important, um, uh, which I kind of rephrase in, in the idea of students leading the classroom. And, uh, and that's another really important aspect, whether, I mean, we can discuss about um, uh, advantages of disadvantages of bringing this personal issues on how personal can you make it when, when it comes to your life. But uh, I think you nail it with that comment, uh, students leading the classroom. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that she found an opportunity and, and it's hard to know exactly just by reading the article because it is fairly brief, but I feel like that she made a decision at some point. She reflected on this experience, this bad experience, and thought, okay, there is a teachable moment. And probably some of her decision-making was based on the fact that the students could take ownership of their own learning by her sharing that experience. And I think, again, the example would be them filling out the forms. They became the experts. That she saw that based on the profile of this class, because I, I – um, this particular class was an insurance class, so this was a content-based class, and so part of their learning uh, was uh, was about insurance and that type of thing. So they, uh, she found an opportunity for them to really, really turn the situation around and say, okay, maybe she's the, their client, and the roles may have reversed, and so she kind of took it upon herself to say, okay, this is what I. I need what would you do in this type of situation and and really just bring out a couple of uh, lessons that really uh, help the students to really engage in this type of uh, class. I think that um, it, it is kind of a um, delicate situation I think anytime that we make our lives you know available to our students and, and to what degree that we we make our teaching personal. And I think um, all of our egos, I think we have to have our egos in check. And when we look at to what degree we make it personal, and I think this is a very good example where it does work, but I think we can also imagine maybe situations where it might go too far if, if we're, you know, maybe sharing too much about ourselves, maybe. I think it really depends on the, on the teacher, depends on the group of students, and I think it also uh, depends a lot on the awareness that the teacher has right. about the students, knowing the students and really what, they, what their comfort level is, what their knowledge base is, and what the goals of the course are. Right. Yeah, uh, 
You know, I'm amazed by all these comments because with a simple chunk of an article, many things come to my mind. Right now, I'm thinking about my ESP group. Uh, they're carrying out a needs analysis. I'm thinking about my teaching worship students. I'm thinking about many aspects that w- in which we can analyze this. So, so I'm happy we have this space because because we can share these kind of things. But Absolutely. something you mentioned is about the in-progress decisions in the classroom in combination with the final comment you made about awareness, which uh, I totally agree. If if you that's the lead for your in-progress decision, the awareness of uh, everything, of students themselves, of yourself, your previous experiences, uh, activities you have planned before and you know how to handle. And, and that's how you can improvise. And I'm doing a quotation uh, Quoting marks and at, at the screen, and um, uh, because it's not really an improvisation, it's bringing back something you already done, you are aware of, and then making a decision. And this is what uh, we want pre-service teachers to do: to start developing this skill of quick, fast reflection. That we are doing it step by step, little by little information. But once you are in service. Is seconds, and you make that decision, and you go there, and then you flip a class into students leading it. I like that. Yeah, and and I think it's although she made it sound in the article that she kind of deviated from the lesson plan, and then she came back to the lesson plan. Right. And although that may have been the case, I would dare say that what she did in in the class with this particular experience still was very much in line with the course objectives. So Mm -hmm. although she may have deviated from the lesson plan, I think it's important to note that it's still, we're still within the confines of the, the course. If we're, if, because we're, you know, we're in formal education, we're, we're, we're helping uh, pre-service and service teachers uh, and English language trainers. And so we're for the most part, helping them train to work in some sort of formal educational context. For example, working in schools where there's a syllabus, there's a curriculum. So giving that context, of course, informal learning is a total different situation. But if we are uh, looking at formal education, we we are, you know, we, we have to look at the course objectives. So I think what she, her ability here was to turn a real life situation or a real life experience and bring it into the course, still maintaining the uh, course objective. So I think this is important too for teacher trainers to, to consider is, you know, it, it's one thing and I, I, all, I agree that it's very important to try to plan ahead and make really good lesson plans. But um, I don't know about you, PD, but I'm constantly looking for certain situations. I'll be driving down the car and I'm driving down the street in my car and on the way to work and think, oh, well, you know, this, I'm going to try this today. I'm going to try that today. And I think with experience, you bring in these, these, uh, these types of uh, personal experiences and uh, to, to the degree that you think benefit the students. Yeah, I, I, I go for that too. I'm always, uh, whenever something happens that it's catchy, that, that, that it clicks in my mind uh, to bring to the classroom uh, just one, one of the key aspects is that you have to know what's the objective for the following class. You have to be aware of what is going to come next. And um, so whenever something happens, you are not just thinking about the activity or the catchy aspect or the contextualized aspect. You have the objective in mind, and that's what makes the connection. And this is really important because sometimes uh, we focus too much in the activity that we m- lose track of the objective. and uh, But this is a nice example of how to make a combination. He never lost track of what could be next in the classroom and bring those activity and raise interest because, well, and in fact, this is one of the aspects of ESP. You need to have contents, con- constant communication with your students so you know what you can get from them. And there are things they for sure will know more than you because in ESP, in occupational purposes specifically, they will know more about the field than the teacher. So there are many things that they already uh, can handle and bring into the classroom. Uh, so I, I totally go for that too. I agree with the, with this idea and, and, and leads me to the idea of contextualization. Yeah, um, 
I'd like to remind everyone that uh, our today's broadcast, uh, if you want to follow us on Facebook, you can certainly do that just by searching Teacher, uh, Teacher Learning Cast. And we do have a Facebook page where you can find all upcoming broadcasts. Uh, we really encourage all of you to participate. We're always looking for those who want to participate in our, in our live broadcast and our hangouts on air. Really want to get uh, more uh, pre-service and in-service teachers uh, involved in the conversation. You can also get involved in the conversation by just simply posting uh, basically in, in Facebook. That's probably the best, best bet. But you can also follow us um, online. Uh, I have a website, and uh, that's located at benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. And Petey has his website. Yeah, Ben, uh, I just want to heads up. I think the, the live streaming right now on YouTube is not going on, but uh, we are still recording the session and we have this live streaming through different sources and uh, you can have access on demand later on. So, because uh, I'm, I'm asking my uh, the followers in Facebook to click on the link above and go to the original streaming, but I can see at the screen that it's not going on right now. We don't have the live streaming at, at YouTube, but uh, well, we put it on demand, so don't worry about it. And yes, I do have my webpage, uh, my webpage where you can see, well, it's, it's, it's my narcissist uh, space <laughs> where you can see what I do at work, but you can also watch the TLC transmissions and the links to the previous cast. And that's at Homers 2000 with double M and, and numbers, Homers 2000.weeksite.com slash PDHA. And, you, and the link is also above and you can click there and you can get to my website and uh, surf around and see what you can find. And I also have on my website that the the at benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. I have a link called um, or a tab at the very top or a page I should say, uh, teacher learning cast. And uh, there you should be able to see the broadcast uh, as well. I, I understand maybe we're having some technical difficulties right now, but uh, it will be made available there. All recordings will be posted uh, to that page as well. And we're trying to find the best way to organize all of our uh, video content so that it can be easily found. Right. So, Pity, I know that you had finally, some... before, before going on, just remind everybody uh, to get involved, please. The idea of this cast, of these transmissions, is to get communication flowing, and we would like to hear from you right now. You can post it on Facebook or by any source. You can send it to us, email or whatever. And, but you can do it later on when you look at the on-demand transmission and um, and you can contact us. You can give us your comments, ask questions, request for topics, and, and we can uh, we want to invite you to come. We want you all to be part of this. And if possible, we, we are available for you to show up to, to the transmission. And we want to make uh, this part the core of this transmission, you guys getting involved. But I know it's just the beginning. And thank you for watching. So what's next, Ben? Well, uh, next, I think you had some uh, interesting comments. It's kind of related to what we talked about in the first segment, uh, bringing context into EFL classroom. So uh, could you share with us a little bit about uh, what you're thinking in terms of uh, content-based learning? Right. Uh, yes, I was thinking about many topics for this week, but this is one of the aspects I normally take with my students. And, and we always, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, always naggy about having context in the classes. And this is because of the idea that here in our context, we are in Aguascalientes, Mexico. And um, here in our context, uh, education leads for the idea of the teacher presenting information and the students just uh, following and doing some practices uh, about it. And, and the focus is that, just to have some information in which students will practice, no matter what kind of practice it is, as long as they practice the information that was given by the teacher. So uh, I, I met with my teacher's informa information about adding a context, adding a real context to the classroom. I found, uh, I want to share with you guys, I found mm, this. I found, I don't know if you can look at my screen right now and you're going to see. Yes, I see it. How to set a context. I found, this is this, this is one of the 
shares that are quick views about uh, main elements, quick uh, guides for main elements in the classroom. I just wanted to see you all. It's very short. You can read it, but it's really concise and precise on different aspects. Obviously, while it's focusing on this different aspects, which are topic, context, function, and form. The guys at Facebook may not be able to see it right now because uh, we are doing the, tr the official transmission in a different way, but you can go back on demand and look at this, um, at the link and, 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 and this idea. But what I want to focus on isn't the aspect of the context. It says context, the where and why of the language situation, taken to a friend who is looking for a job that is in, in uh, Looking for, for a job, uh, that's a context, right? Uh, if you go through the reading, it gives you a little bit uh, of idea of, of, of uh, the context idea. But I wanted to make uh, different aspects because context is not that simple. It's not just thinking about what I'm going to bring into the classroom. And I, I, I managed to separate two different points of view of context. Uh, the first one is uh, whether to set... Uh, Topic of interest for students, a broad context. In other words, something like if you're talking about health, if you are talking about sports, if you are talking about famous people, if you're talking about Hollywood or whatever you bring into the classroom, into the English classroom, right? Uh, but you, you may be able to be more specific and you may be able to have a situational context. Now, yes, you may talk about health, but the question is what about health And what exactly is the situation in which you would talk about health? I don't know if I'm, if I'm uh, making this through. Uh, it's not just going to medicine, but in which situations of life you actually talk about medicine. Does that make sense, man, to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when we look at context, we're looking at basically everything that's not linguistic, right? The whole situation and just remove the language part and you basically have the context. So for me, what I think of relationships, what's the relationships between the speakers? What's the, the, the purpose, not necessarily the, lingui the, the linguistic function, but the purpose of the situation, the purpose of the doing or being in that situation, um, maybe some historical accounts of the relationships between these people or the relationships between the people and and the place. And right. so it really looks at every possible uh, aspect of a situation, but removing the, the language part. And, and so as teachers, we try to think of that, how can we bring that as much as possible uh, to the situation, to the classroom, so that uh, students are not just thinking language, but they're thinking beyond language Right. And in terms of relationships and the historical context, uh, et cetera. Right, right. And, and, and it's, it can be as simple as just making the right questions. Uh, the, the context is not just about the topic, but also the where and the why you are going to use the language. Uh, it would be something like, in, uh, that's the question I, 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 I constantly bring to my teacher's information is, in which action of life, you would do that. You would use that piece of language, whether vocabulary or grammar or structure or whatever you are developing in them. If you're talking about listening, in which situations of life you would normally listen to this piece of language? Uh, and maybe the class is focused only on presenting vocabulary, repetitions and pronunciation in order for making students uh, go through all these processes or different approaches to do it. But even at that moment, if you raise the question in which situations of the real life they would use this vocabulary and what for, why, this may lead you even to modify even the material you use. Uh, the where and the why, it's really important because it's not the same to talk about, let's go back to the example of medicine, It's not the same to talk about medicine with the doctor at the doctor's office or talking about medicine with uh, friends at a coffee place in which you happen to discuss the situation of somebody being, uh, being sick, right? Uh, or or, or being, uh, being not, not that well in their health. So, uh, and that's teacher's decision according to 
going back to the topic we discussed earlier, um, how well you know your students mm -hmm. and what can you actually bring into the classroom and, and what will make them become the, le the leaders and leaving the classroom because of the context itself, right? Yeah, I, I think that knowing your students really is the difference between knowing what the topic or the activity, if it's relevant, if it's, if it's meaningful for the students. I mean, it could be meaningful. Um, you know, showing them how to change a tire might be meaningful, but it may not be relevant depending on the yeah. profile of the students. So I think this idea of context, knowing the where and the why of the situation, again, is, okay, is this relevant for the students? I always tell my students when they're thinking about they're in front of a class and they're and they're and they're teaching is be prepared for those students that are in the back of the class raising their hand asking teacher why are we doing this why are we learning this particular yes. you know topic why, why are we doing this and you know hopefully whatever they're doing with their students it's going to be obvious what the value is what the relevance is but it may not be. So we need to be prepared also as teachers to be able to articulate that, to be able to explain, okay, well, this is why you need to know this. This is, you know, this is why this is important. But I think thinking of context and really in your lesson planning, when you're thinking about how you're going to bring together the why and the where of the context, try to keep that in mind. I think it's important to keep that relevance in mind so that everything that they do has some relevance right that's that's our goal right right and, and you bring to my mind i just a couple of weeks I, I gave a presentation on the use of language i think i mentioned that last week the use of language and the use of voice in the classroom and one of the aspects aspects is that uh the audience when you speak they just care about three things mainly which is what is it that you have to say the core thing of it why do i need to know that and how do i do it and that's it. If everything else is it, it's not relevant, and that's pretty much what you just said, right? When when I think about a context, it's it's that you need to know uh, the why's and the hows, the situation of that piece of language that you are going to teach. But I want to go a little bit beyond because that's not only the that's not the only aspect we can focus on dividing or, or completing the context. There are also an, another aspect that I manage, which is uh, having an explicit context or having a content integrated context. Let me re-explain a little bit because these are words that just come from my mind and I put them like that. But these are uh, technical concepts based on, uh, on, uh, on theory, right? The explicit context would be the idea of telling a student uh, the situation and trying to simulate the situation in the classroom, making a students aware uh, directly or indirectly, that it's a simulation in real life, right? So once you decided the where, the why, and the situation of the real life, you simulate with the students, and they know they are in a play, and, and they are in a role, and they are in a simulation. Whether you just tell them to imagine, whether you bring an image, whether you give them a role or something, okay? But there's another way to bring context, which is directly without simulating, actually having uh, a content class in which the content itself occurs in the classroom. Like going back to the previous talk, I think it's one example, right? This, uh, uh, the, the teacher from the, from the article you read us, Ben, a while ago, uh, she had a situation, a real life situation, losing the briefcase and then having a students with experience about aspects related to the situation and managing to have a real context in the classroom in which everybody got involved, got interested in the class, and it was not a simulation. It was something real. So the question in here, and this is the food for thought about this topic, is what would you do with your students that will actually have them uh, really consider the context as the main important part of the class while you as a teacher care about the language, right? But what will you bring that is not simulated, that is actually real for students? What do you think about it? Or what would you do then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that is the question. I mean, that, that's, that's the question I think we all try to consider when we think how authentic can our classroom experience be? 
And I, you know, for me, the first thing that I think about is some sort of service learning. Service learning being that there are many causes out, out in the world. There are many real life problems. If we want to look at problem, uh, problem-based learning, for example, right. what kind of problems in that are currently out there that students can be a part of? Okay, maybe they don't have all of the solutions. And maybe it's not even important that they solve any particular problem, but maybe they work towards a problem. Maybe they better understand a problem by getting engaged and looking at how they can be, become involved. I think technology, you know, we always talk a lot about technology, but, you know, technology really affords us opportunities or and affords our students to become involved, to be, to be part of the actual community and try to find ways to solve problems, work towards problems, or better understand problems. And I think this is, uh, I think this is the question. I think even um, pre-service English language teachers, uh, it's never too early to begin thinking about how they can really start incorporating their experiences uh, and the real world experiences into to the classroom. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, enjoying the talks with you because you bring really interesting points that, that remind me a lot of situations that I've lived in my classroom. I, I, I just right now with your comment, I remember uh, we read an article about uh, the challenges of being a teacher, being a new teacher, getting to the real world. But one of the, one of the key aspects in there is uh, that the author mentioned uh, that, We need to uh, make students uh, to, to have the questions for themselves, to question themselves. I mean, whatever we present in the classroom, have to be, it has to be something that students need to know because they already have the question. So the first part of teaching would be making students to raise the question. And, and, and he put it in a simple way. Why would you give an answer to something that students have never uh, the curiosity to know or, or to answer, right? And, and, and yes, this context idea and this idea of the where's and the why's, uh, it's, it's helping us to raise the questions, right? If you set a proper context of interest, which raises the interest of students, which has a proper wondering or the wonder, uh, the proper... Um, Uh, key to make them feel the need to use that piece of language, it's going to work. And just, well, my point today was this, to, to make the difference between, all right, the context has divided into a broad context, just having a background of it, which a, a wide topic, and being specific about the situation in which you would use in real life that context, and the other division, whether am I going to simulate it in the classroom, or I'm going to prepare everything to make it something real for students. Yeah, I think the last thing I would end with that is, you know, the communication again is important and we, we focus on, on communication, but I think it's really about relationships and our, having our students realize how understanding the context, the where and the why, understanding how they can improve and become better communicators really at the end of the day allows them to be, to have better re relationships. So I think If we can help them realize the relationships that they currently have and how they can form and continually to grow those relationships through their understandings of the language and of the content and this, of the situation, I think that's I think we're on the right track. Yeah, yeah, right. And that's a question for everybody. How you how do you bring context into your classroom teachers? Do you often bring context into your classroom? Do you simulate the context or do you actually bring something that more like test task based approaches like doing real context in the classroom? All right, we're how are we doing in time, Ben? We're okay here. We've got probably 20 minutes left, so more or less. Okay, and uh, we remind everybody that we have different sources for streaming. Today we have technical problems with the YouTube streaming, but you can follow on demand later on. And uh, maybe you are watching right now on demand. <laughs> and um, just we want you to share with us. Give us comments about the topics. Send us questions and uh, work with us. Because right now we are getting into 
what I want to make a weekly thing, share uh, an actual vivid experience of the week, something we have read, something we came across, a situation we it, it happened to us, and we invite you to share with us your week situation. So, right, Ben, and what was your situation your, this week? Yeah, I'd like to add before before I get into my experience too, one last thing too, just uh, to our listeners, um, as PD introduced a question asking everyone how they would uh, introduce context or information, context or content into their own classroom. Uh, we, we really recommend or we have no problem uh, revisiting certain topics again uh, in another week. So for example, next week, if you want to come in and share some of your experiences in our broadcast, we would love that. Uh, that's why we're here. This is why we're doing it. So we really have no problem revisiting any of the topics that we've seen in the past. If it's something that you want to uh, bring and share, uh, that's that's what we're all about. This is why we're, we're doing this. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, really, anyone has a, everyone has an open invitation. It's just a matter of getting with us and so that we can uh, schedule it and bring it in uh, to the uh, live experience. That's so correct, speak, correct. speaking of live experience, yeah, uh, yeah, we have a segment here. It's one of my favorite segments uh, right now is sharing experiences. And uh, what we try to do on a weekly basis is to think about, reflect on the current week and see what we can share. So uh, this week, I'd like to share briefly a, an experience. Again, I'm going to share my screen here so that I can show you a recent post, a piece that I did uh, looking at the looking at a recent uh, classroom experience that I had. And I titled the piece, Academic Writing Self-Assessment. This week I am teaching a fourth semester composition class and uh, we're working on our first essay. And we've been working on it for some time, maybe three weeks or so, uh, developing, uh, putting together a five paragraph essay. And uh, this is an academic essay where students are expected to uh, cite and use APA, um, the American Psychological Association, uh, writing format for citing and referencing uh, different pieces, different sources. And what I tried uh, this week, and I hadn't taken this, I've never taken this exact approach before, um, but I wanted to uh, share and have a group discussion with my students uh, about certain uh, writing errors. So what I did was I went through and uh, looked at their Google Docs. All of my students have a individual Google Doc that's shared with me so that I can also go in and make, make comments, make changes, or make suggestions to their work. And uh, what, uh, what I did was I went through, without really leaving a lot of comments, but just kind of getting a feel for certain errors that I saw uh, throughout the group, came up with a list the list, in fact, that you see here. Uh, this list is in no particular order, but there are some, I would label common academic writing errors that I commonly see, not just in this group, but in every group that the, that I come across. These are uh, errors that, that, uh, that I speak probably 80 to 90% of my time on. Uh, so they're very, very common. So I created a list and with the class as a group, I basically took one point or one error at a time and we looked at each one and discussed them. So we're in class, all of our students have internet access. Um, all of my students have some sort of device. I would say probably 60% of them have a laptop because again, this is a writing class, so it's, it's comfortable for most students to use a standard uh, keyboard. Um, everybody else, all the other students, probably 40 or so <clears throat> percent, they use their uh, cellular phone. All right, but they all have access to their, uh, their document, their Google document in class in real time. So what we do is I take each error at a, at a time and they go through and make those changes one at a time. So I'll give them a few minutes for each one of these as they go through and uh, make some of the changes. Now, some of these errors require more time that they can that they can possibly do in one class. But the point is that I want them to at least understand the error and ask questions if they're not sure how to fix the error or how to identify the error. 
so that we take each one in turn as a group and we kind of work as a group to go through some of these, uh, again, common errors that, that I typically see. So uh, we tried it this, uh, this week. I did record the session and uh, I recorded it as a video, but decided later to just upload it as a podcast, as just an audio file. Mm -hmm. And I just for those who are interested, I, I'm using Internet Archive for uh, my repository, my audio repository. But it embeds very nicely here into this post. I wanted my students then to have access to this post in my, in my website so that they could go back to the list if they, if they need to, and if, if needed, they could also go back to the audio. But um, I'm still going through some of the, uh, we're still going through some of the changes and in, in, in the documents. Um, I did notice after I implemented this class that students were still making a lot of the changes. So um, I'm still evaluating whether or not how successful or not this particular class was. Um, but I, I think my change in approach this time around was the first time providing feedback, less comments directly in the document, and having them have more of a, an opportunity to self-assess so that they can start looking at the, their own particular errors. And one thing I forgot to mention that, I, is, that was really, the, in fact, the, the, the reason for doing this, I wanted the students to create two columns. So as they were looking at each of the errors, they put in one column things that they did well, and in the second column, things that they needed to consider or maybe things that they needed to uh, look into or ask questions about later, but that they have two columns. And uh, my, my hope, it was that going through here that they could first see what they do well because uh, invariably some students are, they're not missing, you know, the, they don't have all of these errors at once. They, they do some of these things fine other things they need to work on. But I wanted them to recognize the things that they already do well. And as we do this, if, we just, if I decide to do this in, in a future essay, over time, the hope is that they will see that they are beginning, they're uh, making less errors or, or they're, they're improving in certain types of errors, but that they will, they can, uh, they'll have the self-awareness through the self-assessment process of uh, improving their writing. Van, and I'm just uh, amazed because it's raising in my mind the idea that uh, uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but it, it, this is self-assessment, but at the same time, this is shared with everybody else. Uh, and, and the resources, the technology is giving you the opportunity of having, again, a different format from a traditional point of view. What I mean is we have self-assessment, we have tutor's assessment, and we have peer assessment. We have external assessment, but this kind of assessment becomes uh, something different. And, and I think, and I suppose uh, there are other teachers doing something similar, right? But uh, um, I wonder if anybody has ever reflected on the idea that this is a new term for assessment because it's a self-assessment, which is not only self-assessment, it's shared, it's open, and other students can go through it and uh, and it provokes them to have their own self-assessment, but at the same time, based on somebody else's assessment, which I think changes the picture, right? It's, it would be interesting to talk about this deeply in a further cast and uh, see if we can find any lead about uh, this new format. Um, it, it came to my mind the idea of communication uh, before we had the the speaker the the message and the receiver and now with technology it all changes uh, but this is also the same right it's self-evaluation which is not only the student himself evaluating himself with a guide it's much more than that yeah well I, this is one of the things i talk a lot about with my students because since my students as your students same you can i'm sure you can relate that right. um you, we set we set the example for better or for worse we're setting the example. I mean, they're looking at us and looking at what we do and evaluating, okay, is this good or is this not? Is the, what the teacher's doing, do we agree with the, his pedagogical approach or do we not? And, and, you know, that's normal and that's what we want our students to be doing as future right. teachers. 
So yeah. one of the things I want them to realize is that I know that I ask my students to work transparently and some students may or may not be used to, to doing that, but there is a reason. And I want them to show that even though I'm asking them to work transparently, I, as their instructor, am also working transparently in that my, the way that I'm evaluating, the, my sharing today with everyone, what I'm doing with my students and how I'm evaluating, I'm being assessed as well. People are looking at me and saying, okay, that either is the dumbest idea I've ever seen, or <laughs> that's that might be something to, to consider. And that is something that I have to accept. In fact, I personally embrace that because right. in my post, there is a little comment section at the bottom. So if someone wants to share and agree or disagree, show another perspective or share a variation on what I'm doing or make a suggestion, it's all good. It's all good. And so for me, this is why I like to to do this, not just for, you know, for right, right. for the pleasure of doing. I mean, but yeah, I like to do this because I want to show part. students that, yeah, I, I'm also being critiqued, that I'm also being under the the, the magnifying glass when others are looking at other educators who have more experience than I do, have more knowledge right. and experiences that they are critiquing whether they decide to leave a comment or not, whether they decide to follow or not. But that's that's kind of the point. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about is really just this beyond the classroom experience with just the students, but also now the teachers being part of the the evaluation the evaluative process. Now and we can take it a step further and you know I could in my class right give out a questionnaire where I ask them, okay, how do you feel about the class? You know, what, how are things going? Or do you, did you like when I did this particular thing or, or whatever? Um, that's, that's something that's, um, that, that, that's a possibility, but it can't happen until we as the teachers decide, okay, I'm willing to make my own practice, my own teaching practice more transparent. Right. And that raises the bar and that, that gets you gets out of the comfort zone. zone. And, and makes you, you do, better do better for the for right, right reason, reason that you decided to do better. <laughs> the, nobody else has to supervise you. Uh, right. I, I, I don't know if, if you want to add anything to that or, or we can... No, start. no, I, I, I want to leave some time for your, uh, your uh, shared experience. Yeah, I just want to tell to the Facebook people that is watching that I'm running out of battery. So the transmission at Facebook Live may run off very soon. But uh, you can watch on demand at the live streaming in YouTube. The link is up there and it will be there. At, right now we have some tech problems with the live transmission at YouTube, but it will be on demand after the show. So if, just in case uh, the Facebook Live runs out. And uh, well, my, my experience of the week, this week I've been... Uh, struggling a little bit with the students in, in different ways, uh, uh, mainly about feedback. I want to talk about feedback. And this is uh, my situation is teachers information and teachers uh, who are preparing lesson plans, having classes, observing teachers, but at all moment they reflect. And, uh, but, but the most important thing is when they come with their lesson plans, uh, well, all of the aspects are important, right? But when they come with their lesson plans, and we have a feedback on their lesson plans or when they have already taught a class and they have feedback on the class, the struggling of it. And I want to focus on one aspect. There's a lot to say about feedback. There's a lot to talk about and to, and, and, and to discuss. But I want to focus uh, mainly on one of the first aspects from Pendleton, who's uh, an academic from medicine, and he is one of the traditional experts on, on, on feedback given. And uh, maybe I can share this very quickly because uh, I, I even have an image. I don't know if you see in my back part right here. This is my Pendleton model for feedback, so I can keep it outside at all time. Um, let me share with you very quickly this. I don't know if you can see my screen, Ben. Uh, yes. Can see you see it. that? Perhaps the best known model initially recommended for medical interns. Uh, wait, it's still, it's still coming up. One second. Okay. Um, are you on in your browser now? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing an image. I don't know if you can see that. No. Oh, okay, get it. Yeah, I know what what happened there. Sorry, I shared the wrong screen. Okay. Uh, let me let me go back again. So very quickly, you see this. Here it is. Is this one? And that's that. Now you can see the. Here we go. That's right. it. Right. This is something I found out in the images at Facebook, right? But it's based on Pendleton Modern. I mean, it's Pendleton Modern for for feedback. And and I want you to call the attention to the first one. It says check the observe once and it's ready for feedback. And I'm gonna stop right there about the technical aspect. Uh, because this is what I what it what I struggle with this week, the student's mood for feedback, being ready for feedback. Uh, it came, it it was in different moments during the week that I saw students in different reactions towards the situation of having the feedback. Some of them express it, some of them didn't, some of them look anxious, some of them were not really willing to receive the feedback because of any reason, right? And uh, I become aware, I, I, I always try to follow this model and I always try to be um, uh, careful about the students being ready to receive the feedback. But at the end, I managed to realize I tend to, anyhow, no matter what, I managed to give the feedback. And what happened to me this week is that there was a situation with, with a student in which it was not the right moment to have feedback by any reason. So whatever I said would come in a misinterpretation from the student. And there was a moment in which he even externed that, that uh, there, was a, a, there was a lack of communication that started that with the, the, the person that is going to receive the feedback, not being in the mood, not being ready for the feedback. And me, as a tutor, giving the feedback, not working in that aspect and getting into the point because of matter of matters of time. So my experience of the week is is based. I, I wouldn't like to be much more specific about it, but but I think I made my point in there. We need to be very careful when we are going to uh, and, and taking your comment about uh, other people uh, critiquing our work or what we do. We need to be careful on having a uh, same tone. Uh, or maybe not the same mood, but maybe the same tone and agree on the communication channel so that we are all open to go back and forth in this situation of the feedback, to, to have the proper questions, to have the, the, the proper answers, and also the tone so that it becomes meaningful. It wouldn't mind, it, it wouldn't be relevant if if the feedback goes on, if we evaluate, we, it's kind of assessment. It's having assessment with students and giving, giving them information about assessment. And, and, uh, and, and it wouldn't be relevant if it doesn't get through. So, so there's yeah. a way in which we should ease the situation with the students and with ourselves, because sometimes we are not ready to give the feedback or we are not in the mood to give the feedback. And, and, and it's something that called my attention this week. And for sure, it's something I'm going to remember uh, every time I give feedback. I'm curious. That, can you bring up that list again? Because I, I I know that you only want to talk about the first one, but um, right. can we look at that just really for one second? Because right. I I have a question yep. that kind of relates, I think, more than just to the first. Right. Um, all right. So yeah. Okay. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna click on. Okay. So. Yeah, so your your main focus is on the first point. Check the observee once and is ready for feedback. Yeah. And I'm looking at the rest of the, the points here. You know, states the observee states what has done what was done well. The observer states what was done well. Um, uh, sorry, PD, I think you have another uh, browser. Oh, up. sorry. Yeah, sorry. I forgot I was sharing my screen. Okay. No <laughs> I was going to make a comment on the Facebook live streaming. Yeah, okay, sorry. No um, so I'm curious in your experience, Bidi, as, as a tutor. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these and I guess, are these are in, are these in any particular order? Oh, uh, well, it, it yeah. tends to be in an order, but it, but I, I came to realize it doesn't really have to follow that order according to the situation because sometimes certain topics uh, raise uh, the back and forth with the students. So 
So yeah. you cannot wait for everything to be said by students and then everything by the tutor and then everything in a conclusion. Maybe you can get to back and forth and then you conclude on one issue and you skip to the next one. So, but, but originally this is the model to follow when uh, in order. Yeah, I was wondering if we ever just outright ask the students, are you ready to receive feedback? <laughs> No, but I think that that's uh, even a valid question because even, of course, we want to try to pick up the clues and all of that, but right. but even them externalizing if they are ready or not ready and why they are ready or why they're not ready and right. have them share that with, even before you have the conversation, if that's even a worthy consideration. It's curious that you mentioned that because it's exactly what happened. I when when I had this student telling me, I'm not in. I, I'm not. When I asked a couple of questions, he couldn't answer. So he was like saying, like, I'm not in a thinking way. I'm not in in the mood for thinking right now, and 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 continue with this. What I tend to do, I expand the reflection at the moment of the feedback, mm -hmm. and uh, and he mentioned that a couple of times, and and I never asked that question. At, at that point. Mm -hmm. And what happened there is that since I didn't ask the question, I was just inferring. He's tired or he doesn't want to be here. It's late in the, it's late afternoon. And, 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 and that was my inference. But there was a moment in which I did ask the question and, but it was maybe a little bit late because he had a different perception of the situation. He never right. realizes he was in that mood since the very beginning. So he, he, focus on a different aspect on a different moment of the feedback and he attribute his mood to that moment of the feedback. I don't know if I'm making myself clear in that sense. He attribute his mood to something I would have said during the feedback, but I can tell that he had the mood since before. And the problem is that I never asked that question. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking even if he can pinpoint why whether whether you as or we as tutors know or not whether we know you know it, just by having the person communicate that articulate that yes might be part of the way that we get to a point where he or she becomes ready to receive feedback because you know i you know that's that's it, it is a you know teaching is uh it's very easy to take it personally right Right. And, and one of the things that I tell teacher trainers is that take teaching seriously. Don't take it personally. Right. Take it seriously, but don't take it personally. So when somebody's critiquing you, somebody uh, doesn't agree with you, take it all in. Take it seriously. You decide what to take, what not to take, what to consider, what not to consider. But try not to take it personally. And believe me, I know it's something it's easy to say, hard to do. You know, I, we're all human beings. This is a very personal, you know, endeavor. It's a, it's a profession that we feel passionate about. We want to help people. And I think all of our intentions are, are, are always good. But uh, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes we it's easy to take things personally. So, yeah, I think that's – that's. Uh, an interesting uh, experience. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I think it really makes us all reflect on our own teaching, whether we're in a tu tu whether we're a tutor or not, we as teachers are always taking on a role of tutor in certain cases. And I think we can all relate to that where, you know, I can see in my students, nice. I, I can detect sometimes when they're not ready. And there are times where I know that I don't detect it and I don't realize it, and they're just not ready, you know. So it's it is kind of a kind of a dance back and forth between okay, how much space do I give them? How when do I intervene? When do I not? And yeah, it's just kind of going back to what we talked about at the beginning here, knowing our students and and really try to form that relationship that allows for communication to happen, so that that we work together you know it really is a two-way communicative you know uh relationship that has to happen for 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 everybody to succeed you know it makes me, it makes wonder, me wonder in the cases in, in which the teacher, teacher just, just, just comes to the comes classroom, to classroom gives back, gives back and exam or something with a grade in there 
and it stops there. <laughs> it, yeah. it makes me wonder about that because that's feedback too for students. What kind of feedback it is, and and beyond going through the analysis of just giving back a grade, forget about that. Think about which is the student's mood to receive that information at that moment. Since yeah. it, since the one that it, it does, it may be that is not really relevant to which grade he's getting for himself or herself. Uh, it's not relevant for me whether I get a six, a seven, a nine, or a zero, or the ones that are really apprehensive in the sense that if I got a nine, I need urgently to know why and which was my mistake or something like that. And and and, and it makes me wonder uh, something related to this same thing is, are they ready? What is this going to cause in them? What's the backwash effect of having this? feedback, whether as simple as, as giving a grade or as complex as having a back and forth in a reflection. Perhaps we should change the title, the sessions from feedback sessions to self-awareness sessions, because Good. really it's about the self-awareness. I mean, the yeah. feedback is arbitrary. I mean, really, right. you know, what you, what we as tutors say is yeah. not nearly as important as the what effect they have to say. They have on the students and their own self-awareness and their own growth and so, but yeah. And there's another topic we can take later on because we can discuss about feedback, many things. And yes, I totally agree with you. There are things that they have to become self-aware and, and there are things they, they are not willing to become self-aware and you need to start opening the door somehow. And we can discuss about on a further show because I think it's time to finish our cast from today. Uh, sadly, my Facebook Live, my, my mobile phone, die today with the battery die and uh and i stopped the cast a while ago but it's going to be on demand for everybody and uh and uh, i think for today anything else then no i i just want to thank everybody for hanging in there i know we were, we're still uh learning ourselves trying to get some of the technological glitches out of the way uh we had some problems th this week but hopefully we can uh, salvage this recording and get it out and uh, available but we want to uh, share appreciation, gratitude to those who have uh, who try to follow us uh, live and who watch the recordings. We really do want to hear from you. We want to know what kind of topics you want to hear. If something is resonating with you that we're talking about uh, each week, let us know. We really want to hear your comments, uh, the good and the bad, the ugly. We want to hear it all uh, because we can all learn from, from those. So we're doing this. Um, because we want to reach out to the community and start a conversation, be part of the conversation. We don't want, uh, don't we don't expect to have uh, all the answers, but we want to begin the conversation so we can hear from others in the field uh, around common educational topics that uh, that we can relate to that we uh, face on a day to day basis. Thank you, everyone. Biddy, thank you very much as well for participating, um, uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, continuing this. Saturday broadcast, usually in the morning around 8.30 ish. Um, and so set your, set your clocks, set your alarms. And uh, again, get involved, let us know, uh, give us some feedback about what you think of, of our show. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Um, so for me- right, ben, I just want to remind them the ways that they can access and have information about teacher learning cast. And uh, I'm gonna abruptly share a little bit my screen with, with this information. We have the Facebook page. Uh, if you look for us, it's Facebook as TLC ELT. And, uh, and, and you can reach information. There's Benjamin's website also. And there's the link, which is benjaminlstewart.wordpress.com. And you can reach his page. And you can also reach my page uh, at homers 2000 weeksitecom Piri Herrera Alvarado. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Ben, for sharing this experience. I hopefully will see you next week. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next Good time. Good morning. Good morning.